So welcome everybody to this Knowledge Rights 21 webinar on what next for researchers in Europe. And it's going to be a presentation from Katarina Skagner of Santa Ana at the High School at the University of Pisa. And um, to produce, to do a little introduction, first of all, to explain Knowledge Rights 21. Knowledge Rights 21 is a, it's a program um, that's run by Stichting IFLA, IFLA Foundation, but and supported in particular by the Arcadia Foundation. They're the ones who make this work possible bringing together IFLA, LIBA and Spark Europe. It's focused in particular on trying to build up the case on making sure that the interests and the needs of researchers, of educators, of learners, of students, of readers and the institutions that support them are properly heard in legislation. And the need for this is high with the shift towards with the shift into a digital age, the need to actually stop those protections, the rights enabled by copyright limitations and exceptions in the past the need to make sure that these are not being undermined, these are not being hollowed out is high. If we want to make sure that the potential of digital to deliver on the rights to research, education and culture is delivered, we need to act. We have a particularly strong focus on the needs of researchers. There's so much that can be done with modern technology. There's so much potential in the open access movement. It's time really to make sure that these really come to pass. In other areas that we focus on, we look on building fair access to eBooks, protecting users' rights in general, promoting the value of more flexible copyright exceptions, principles-based copyright exceptions, pushing on legislated secondary publishing rights, and this is something that we'll be talking about quite a lot in this session, as well as promoting author rights retention. A thing that makes UK Knowledge Rights 21 unique is our focus not just on working at the European level, but really also drawing on different organisations, building up national networks to make sure that these voices, these interests, these needs are heard in debate at all level. And crucially, as said on this slide, I said we want to see, we have an ambition to see Europe that really follows through on its verbal commitments to supporting research, to supporting access. We believe that there's a virtuous circle between enabling access, enabling research and innovation, and the delivery, the sustaining of Europe's position as a desirable place to live, as an area of innovation, as an area of strength for all of its citizens. We're going to be talking today with uh, Professor. Uh, we're going to be talking today with Professor Katarina Skagno. Um, Katarina is a full professor of comparative private law at Scuola Superiore Santa Anna since August 2024. She joined Santa Anna as an associate professor in October 2018. Prior to that, she was assistant and later associate professor of law at the Department of Legal Studies and the Department of Economics and Business in the Central European University. She holds a PhD in comparative private law from Santana in Santana and an LLM from Yale and an LLB from the University of Pisa. Now, in her work, she's going to be talking in particular about this report. And I think this report is a, a really important one. It's a really interesting one. And I think in particular, it comes at a really interesting time for Europe. Um, I think we are at a really interesting time to be looking at, as I said, looking at research policy. At the risk of oversimplifying things, the past approach, the approach that we've tended to take towards research in Europe has focused on how do we support it with money? How do we focus on leveraging the potential of the billions of euros that the European Union, that national governments inside and outside the European spend every year in order to drive research? And to think rather about what, how can we make sure that we're leveraging this potential through making sure that other laws are aligned, that other laws are effectively friendly, are supporting the goal that we're supporting, that we in turn are supporting with so much money. And I think following the elections and following the naming of the new commissioner's designate, who will be in, in hearings next week, there are some really interesting potential steps. I think we see already that the allocation of resources within the commission indicates a stronger focus on how do we really support research, support innovation, that research and innovation are in with startups rather than being part of a much broader mandate alongside education, research, education, youth culture and sport. This is an interesting step. It allows for greater focus. We have the very clear calls from Letta, from Enrico Letta and Mario Draghi in their respective reports, underlining the need to prioritise research and innovation, talk of a fifth freedom, the freedom of movement of knowledge around the European Union, around the single market. And in the mission letters written by the incoming Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, this focus, there's a number of really interesting pieces of legislation that are proposed that researchers are asked to take forward. All of these offer really interesting opportunities. 
But crucially, we're coming into this with an evidence base. And this is the report that you see on the screen. This is the report that Professor Skagner is going to be talking about that really digs into these questions, offers a really unprecedented evidence base based on a really hugely impressive level of, of, of response rate from researchers across Europe, setting out what it is that they need, what it is that works for them, what it is that will free them up to really deliver the maximum possible for the investment made in them. Um, so in the talk today, I've already mentioned a little bit about Professor Skagner, and the report is incredibly rich. There's so much in there. It's a lot of pages as well. Um, in particular, we're going to be talking about one aspect, an idea which I think we would certainly argue whose idea, whose time has come, that of secondary publishing rights. It's a great example of how we can potentially work through legislation, through making sure that authors, that academic authors, have a clear right to publish their work, to publish publicly funded work in an open access form immediately, how that can back up all of the really strong grassroots work, the funding work that's done in order to promote open access, to promote the dissemination of research. So um, with that, as I said, I, I probably introduced Catherine a little bit too early, but I will definitely introduce her now um, in order to start. And Catherine is going to talk about the report, talk about what's in there. Um, I would absolutely encourage people, you do have access to the question and answer function. We will be leaving time at the end. So if what Katerina says raises questions, if you want to go deeper into anything, please do, you do use that function. But with that, I'd like to hand over to Katerina to take the floor. So I'm going to stop sharing. Thanks a lot, Stephen, and good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here with you today. When uh, I got this invitation from Stephen and Ben, I was really delighted to, 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 to accept and have this opportunity to present the report uh, to, to you. I have um, a presentation uh, that tries to summarize to the extent it is possible with such a mammothian report. Uh, the content of uh, of the of the study. Uh, do you see the slides? Yes, we do. Okay, perfect. So the title of the of the seminar of today is the right right, and uh, we're going to talk mostly about secondary publication right. That was probably the most important piece of policy suggestion with several options we advanced uh, uh, in the report and uh, for the perusal of the European Commission. This is a study that uh, has been carried out in the context of the ERA policy uh, agenda. So th this is, uh, you might be aware of it, it was uh, quite of an articulated uh, agenda around four pillars, deepening a truly functioning uh, internal market for knowledge, uh, twin green and digital transition, and increasing society's participation in the European research area, amplifying access to research and innovation excellence across the Union, and advancing concerted R&I investment and reforms. This uh, um, report, uh, operated within the context mostly of uh, the first pillar uh, where you have uh, also data legislation fit for research and uh, amendment necessary in the uh, current EU legislation to make the open science objective of ERA possible. The study was commissioned uh, uh, in uh, 2023. So it, uh, it was a call, uh, a tender, which was won by PPMI, a consultancy firm uh, uh, that involved uh, Santana with my IP team here, KU Leuven and uh, Ivir uh, Amsterdam. We worked together um, very intensively, I would say, for approximately nine months. And uh, the study, uh, which is available uh, as a publication of uh, from the publication office of the UI. Um, you see the link on the slide. It was already presented. It's entitled Improving Access to and Reuse of Research Results, Publications and Data for Scientific Purposes. Um, it has uh, basically two pillars. One is the mapping of the literature, OS policies, uh, and EU and national copyright and data legislation. And that's what we could 
uh, imagine as the background of uh, the research. Then you have a second pillar, which is um, articulated surveys with researchers, research performing organizations and publishers, both commercial and institutionals on their current experience and uh, their impressions and opinions on uh, the policy options we advanced in the in the study and uh, and the findings uh, we advanced in the study uh, in order to provide already enough material to the commission we also performed an impact assessment of all the policy options we uh, we proposed uh, now the study was articulated around five tasks uh, the first one was directed to evaluate the concrete effects of the EU copyright framework on uh, research. So both data gathering uh, via literature review, desk research and stakeholder consultation and in-depth analysis of the result. Task two was uh, uh, devoted to the elaboration on those areas which were clear, are clearly in need of improvement and potential interventions. And this was the task where we focused on uh, EU secondary publication right and other potential areas of intervention in the EU key. Then task three was uh, uh, mostly focusing on uh, uh, the survey. So, and the impact assessment, the idea was to evaluate the effects of various potential interventions on each stakeholder. Task four was devoted to data legislation. Then task five was uh, uh, follow up a second, the second part of the survey on specific policy options. Now today, of course, in the interest of time and for the focus of this webinar, I will uh, um, report on uh, the results of task one, two, and three. Before moving to secondary publication right, which is in fact, the most interesting uh, um, policy uh, suggestion uh, and probably the most feasible policy action for the next commission to bring forward, uh, um, I would like to show you a bit of the background of what, from where this, this, uh, this, uh, this suggestion is coming from. So the results of the EU and member states copyright laws mapping and literature review. Uh, this part of the study was articulated around three pillars. First, we mapped uh, the EU and member states open science policies and interventions to uh, understand where we are, so to understand what the current state of the art is. Then we perform a thorough mapping and assessment of EU and member states, what we call enablers and disablers for open science in copyright legislation. And we combine this analysis with a literature review of the most important studies, reports, and academic contributions up to date on the interplay between open science and copyright legislation. So to also to uh, emphasize how much this is not a recent debate, but there is already plenty of work out there apart from this report, uh, introducing and commenting on evidence uh, which call for an articulated reforms. The goal was to lay the groundwork for the surveys, the assessment and the development of policy options. What were the key findings of, uh, of the research? In terms of enablers and disablers for open science in the EU copyright legislations, uh, in green, the enablers, in red, the disablers, we emphasize the fact that we already have a wide range of research specific exceptions and limitations, which is a plus, that there are also other provisions out there which can be used as what we call research complementary instruments. So exceptions which might not be necessarily research focused, but they might be used uh, for that purpose. Licensing scheme and public domain rules uh, that can be leveraged. Uh, we also emphasize the fact that there are several provisions in the EU key having a broad language, which leaves more discretion to member states to experiment uh, new solutions, more flexible solutions. And we also welcome the positive paradigm shift of the EU legislator towards mandatory provisions which which are not overridable by contracts, like in the recent copyright in the digital single market directive, all elements which are a plus in terms of greater harmonization, which is necessary for cross-border users, and also for to avoid that uh, contract. So um, 
private agreements trump the balance that is struck by copyright law. Unfortunately, the disablers are much more in number. First of all, research, research focus exceptions and limitations mostly have an optional nature, strict limitation to non-commercial uses, contractual overrideability, and the lack of coverage of collaborative cross-border research, which makes them basically useless in the digital research space. Uh, we also underlined specific problems in the teaching and research exceptions in the InfoSoc Directive, which impact on the national implementations. Uh, we criticize the uncertainty in the notions and the definitions that are used in research focused exceptions and limitations and criticize the fact that the purpose of these exceptions is read strictly. Uh, we also underline the problems that are triggered by the bad coordination between general and sector specific directives. Think about the database directive and the software directive specifically. The fact that we don't have an EU-wide definition of authorship and ownership, which makes it very difficult to understand how to regulate cross-border activities. Uncertainties means chilling effects and less uses. The same applies to the definition of the boundaries of public domain that is not harmonized at the EU level. We once again emphasize that the sui generis database right is far too broad as a scope. And this coupled with the expansive reading of the right to reproduction and communication to the public by the Court of Justice uh, makes it even uh, worse. And uh, we also pointed our finger at the presence of a problematic right, which is the related right for scientific publication in public domain introduced by the term directive, which member states might decide to introduce or not, which brings away from the public domain uh, materials which is there for scientific publication, uh, introducing yet another layer of complexity in the framework. In terms of member states, enablers and disablers, we positively emphasize the fact that several member states implemented, most of them actually, are optional research specific exceptions and limitations, but for the exceptions to the sui generis right uh, in database and, uh, and the copyright on databases, there you have much less implementations. We also uh, applauded the high degree of harmonization of instruments that are complementary to research specific exceptions. And we also noted uh, as a positive uh, element that some member states show a higher degree of flexibility towards research activities uh, by means of the introduction of additional exceptions and limitations, licensing scheme, and especially, this is the case for six member states, secondary publication right. The um, negative or the dark side of the coin is that the vague language and the optional nature of EU-based exceptions and limitation led to really fragmented transpositions of most provisions. So we can state by far that we have a very low harmonization of research-based exceptions. Uh, several member states introduced additional limitations in purpose uh, on these exceptions, which constrain their effectiveness uh, for open science goals. We also notice by looking at national case law, diverging court interpretations on key concepts, which add another layer of legal uncertainties for cross-border research activities. And uh, at the same time, another very problematic aspect is that most of these exceptions focus on education rather than on research. Since the two were put together in the InfoSoc Directive, several member states focus mostly on education and they didn't care much about research. That is a problem today. And last but not least, this law harmonization can be really uh, seen and noticed in the huge divergences you have in beneficiaries, works covered, permitted uses, and you have several additional limitations, introduction of remuneration requirements and conditions of applicability, which create a patchwork of solutions with uh, different degrees of rigidity instead of flexibility, which don't really make research exceptions and complementary exceptions at the national level so useful for open science purposes. 
in terms of key findings on member states' open science policies and interventions, uh, we uh, noted that national approaches uh, are in alignment with EU policies and agenda in terms of open science, that we have mostly soft law instruments uh, with regard to open science nationally, but for those six member states that introduce secondary publication rights in their legislation. The top priority of these interventions is mostly on open access to scientific publications. And the second uh, area of interventions, much less frequent though, is on the accessibility and reusability of data um, stemming from research. So there is something out there, but still it's just soft law. So it doesn't really have the impact you would like to see at a national level. In terms of literature review, uh, so studies, reports, and academic contributions on the interplay between open science and the EU copyright key, you could notice that there is really plenty out there. And uh, the timeline uh, of production of these reports and studies is not recent either because the very first reports started appearing 15 years ago. And they focus on mostly four um, clusters or of arguments and problems. The very first focus and is on negative, mostly negative, unfortunately, comments on the legislative strategies of the EU. They comment on the fact that the terminology is not always consistent and clear, which makes it very difficult for these exceptions to fully perform their role. Um, there are several comments on the negative effects of the divergences in the formulation of key elements, foundations of mandatory and optional exceptions and limitations. Uh, most of these studies emphasize that it's useless to have these exceptions if then they are contractually overreadable because there is a huge um, difference in bargaining powers between users, uh, uh, academic authors, and producers and publishers of academic products, which makes it fair, a huge problem. The fact that you have contractual overreadability and then of course fragmentation of national solutions and uh, low harmonization is another problem. Uh, this is also emphasized by, the, by another cluster of reports that focus on the lack of harmonization, particularly in court cases, which is clearly ending up in fragmentation of national solutions and the greater rigidity of these exceptions. There is a more recent trend of literature that focuses on the interaction of copyright and data related legislations and particularly on the problems created by the database directive in fully implementing the push forward, the push towards greater data sharing in the recent data legislations. And of course, this comes on top of the problems and constraints that come from the text and data mining exception and the way how it was structured by the copyright in the digital single market directive. Um, the last uh, cluster uh, refers to those studies and contributions that focus on the need to reconsider the importance of the harmonization of EU copyright contracts as complementary tool, policy tool to achieve open science goals. Uh, several studies um, underline for the benefit of the commission that there is no harmonization at the EU level of assignment and licensing contracts, copyright contracts on publicly funded research. And this is a problem because that's where the regulation comes much more than from exceptions and limitations. And exactly this is the area where secondary publication right kicks in. Now we, uh, together with the mapping, we also la launched a survey program. These are the numbers. Uh, uh, Stephen mentioned it at the very beginning of, uh, in, in, his in his introduction, we managed to reach out uh, a relatively high number of participants. So almost a thousand uh, on uh, uh, researchers. Uh, almost 600 uh, research performing organizations uh, and around 130 scientific publishers. Uh, you can see the, the, I mean, the number is not so nice if you compare it to the number of invitations we sent, but uh, which was massive, uh, but still those answers were somehow enough 
to particularly because they were geographically representative uh, to be able to uh, derive some statistically relevant uh, information on perceptions of the stakeholders, both with regard to the current uh, experience and with regard to the policy options uh, we formulated. Now, let me move to the uh, core of uh, today's presentation, which is the potential introduction of an EU-wide secondary publication right. First of all, why did we focus on an EU-wide secondary publication right? That was, th this is actually the question uh, that I often receive when I present this report. So let me face it up front. Why to, um, not to play harder, and just to limit ourselves to this. Well, first of all, the report doesn't focus just on that and doesn't advance only this uh, uh, policy solution. We also uh, listed a number of uh, areas where we think that the EU legislator needs to intervene on copyright and data legislation. So there are also policy options, we call them, to intervene on flaws and disablers to open science, we uh, highlighted in the mapping phase and, in, and on the basis of the survey responses. So there are uh, suggestions related to copyright exceptions, to copyright contract tools, uh, to uh, other instruments which might be introduced to make sure that the copyright and data legislations fit with uh, uh, the open science policies of the era. Uh, but we were also fairly realistic in um, understanding that there was a very recent intervention on the copyright acquis in 2019. There was no real wish by the Commission to reopen the Pandora box of copyright, uh, considering the time that the CDSM directive required in terms of debate. So the idea is if we want to achieve something, as early as possible. The most realistic scenario is that we uh, we bet on a new wide secondary publication right. So that's the entry point. That's the, the, the baseline of intervention at the moment, and then we'll see. It's actually an instrument that empowers scientific authors because it helps rebalancing uh, there's an even bargaining powers you have in publishing contracts. So it intervenes exactly on the core problem we emphasize that we have uh, overreadable exceptions and limitations uh, and uh, exceptions and limitations are limited by the three-step test introducing a right that is not overreadable by contract and it's mandatory and it's unwaverable uh, will help rebalancing the power of authors vis-a-vis -vis, uh, publishers. And this will lead to a greater availability of publicly funded research. And the fact that it's not an exception and limitation, but the right is subject to specific conditions, doesn't subject it to the three-step test uh, and makes it having the very same force as other rights. So you play with the same tools. Why harmonized? Why EU-wide? Because you need a single legal framework across the EU. That's a single European common research space. You need a common tool and it needs to be harmonized at the maximum and not at the minimum level. This will also ensure what? Greater awareness in researchers. You know that you have a single tool all across the EU in the consortia, you can share this information and you will be able to build on the knowledge of your partners across Europe knowing that there is just one instrument and that's the one you're going to use. It, by having just one tool and being it harmonized, this will surely facilitate collaborative cross-border endeavors because you don't have any more chilling effects uh, deriving from the fact that you don't know what the legislation is in another country. And on top of this, this will avoid forum shopping because contractual parties will not pick the best legal system for their interest because there will be just one legal solution all across the EU. So you will avoid fragmentation of contractual practices in the internal market and in the European research area. That is something we have to consider since this is a right that interferes, intervenes on contractual practices. 
Secondary publication right is already present in six member states. You had it first in uh, Germany in 2013, then in the Netherlands in 2015, together with Austria, then in France in 2016, Belgium 2018, and Bulgaria at the end of 2023, on top of the implementation of the CDSM directive. In order to give a glance uh, on the um, elements in common and diverging elements uh, in the legislation, uh, we focused on uh, subject matter requirements, uh, the possibility to uh, override contrary contra uh, contractual clauses, version limitation, content in terms of right, embargo period, use limitation, and mention of source. As you can see, there is a relative alignment on some, ish, on some matters and, and divergences in others. In terms of subject matter, there are countries uh, adopting a broader approach. Look at Bulgaria talking about scientific works. Uh, while you have countries being more rigid, uh, scientific contribution uh, by member of staff of research institution that appeared in collections periodically published at least two times a year in Austria, once a year in France, in Belgium, the periodic, uh, the periodical nature of the publication is not specified. In the Netherlands, you don't have a limitation as to the venue of first publication, but it should be a short work of science, so a journal article and not a book. So you see you have different subject matter limitations that are differently shaped. Also in the requirements, uh, most uh, uh, countries uh, require that the research was publicly funded for at least 50% or at least partly publicly funded. In France, you have a limitation uh, that comes from the fact that you need the agreement of all co-authors in order to exercise the right. Um, in all countries, the right is not overreadable by contract, which is probably the most important element of the right, because if it can be derogated, that is like not having it. In terms of content, it's generally the right to make the contribution available to the public free of charge, with some specifications here and there, like in France, then uh, you have a mention to the fact that it should be in an open format and by digital means. The embargo vary because you have one year after the first publication in uh, two countries, uh, while France and Belgium adopt a bipartite approach, six months in science uh, in, uh, in technology and medicine uh, and uh, one year uh, in the humanities and social science. In Belgium, actually, it could be shorter if uh, it's provided in this way by the license or longer if the law so provides. In Bulgaria, you don't have an embargo period. And in the Netherlands, you have a flexible clause that talks about reasonable period, which makes it possible uh, to um, shape, to tailor uh, the period on the basis of, for example, how much the research was funded by public money or by private money. So depending on this, you can also have different embargo periods. Uh, there is a, a relative uh, convergence on the fact that the use should be non-commercial, although in the Netherlands and in Belgium, you don't have any limitation. And in terms of mention of source, uh, uh, four countries out of six require the mandatory indication of the first publication venue, while France and Bulgaria do not require it. What are the policy options you have here? Well, first of all, uh, uh, it, with, with regard to the subject matter, we suggested to opt for a broad range of scientific output. And particularly, research performing organization uh, advocated for broadening uh, the range of scientific uh, output cover, so to go beyond short work and just journal articles because that would be fundamental to increase open access. Of course, publishers were mu very much against it because they highlighted the need to change their business model if this happens. And uh, mm, in terms of legislative measures, here, this is an area where you actually require a fully harmonized uh, EU solution covering a broader range of product because that's the only way to overcome uh, obstacles to full open science. This applies for books, but especially for database protection. 
there is a need here, we emphasize also to investigate the interplay with data regulation and particularly the Data Governance Act and the uh, uh, Data Act. Uh, the non-legislative measure that can be implemented uh, uh, here to enlarge the range of scientific output cover is a stakeholder dialogue to back the development of common national approaches, but this would not really be enough in order to overcome national fragmentation. Second area of policy uh, options and suggestions. We focused on the threshold for public funding. And we emphasize the fact that usually it's very difficult to establish how much of a certain research was actually publicly funded. And this is something that particularly research performing organizations em emphasized. We face a number of uncertainties, a number of problems in uh, establishing uh, what is the percentage, how to calculate the percentage of uh, public fund in a specific research, what are the elements we should consider. So this uncertainty in most of the cases end up in limiting our exercise of the right. So either we uh, lower the threshold for public funding or we eliminate it at all. And in this way, we would solve the uh, uncertainty or we find some other tricks, at least a clarification of these aspects in order to make sure that it's implemented evenly across the uh, EU. This is a particularly a problem that uh, uh, applied sciences are sensitive about because in social science, you have less private contributions while in applied science, there is no such a thing as a research that is carried out just on the basis of public money, or it's really, really, really rare. Of course, research performing organizations are in favor of increasing uh, uh, or lowering the threshold. And what is interesting here is that there are not so many concerns about this point from the publisher's side as much as you have it on other elements of the policy options. Um, legislative measures are the best options in this case. Once again, non-legislative measures are unlikely to solve the problem uh, because uh, uh, stakeholders uh, dialogue uh, would not really solve uh, uh, all the uncertainties and fragmentations you see with regard to the interpretation of this requirement. Third problem, probably the, 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 uh, the, the one together with embargo where you have the most heated debate, uh, re refers to the version of records. Why? Because uh, here in most countries, you have a limitation to the so-called AIM, Authors Accepted Manuscript. Uh, and so the, the version doesn't cover what is called version of record. That is what comes after peer review and comes after the editing process by the publisher. Of course, the version of record is fundamental in order to ensure that references are accurate and there are no multiple versions of the same article circulating. If you have, as it happens now, a preprint version on institutional open access repositories and another version uh, that is the version of record circulating, uh, it's a problem because they might not be the same. It's a problem in terms of citations because the, the article is cited in different manners and generally, particularly, Peer, review, peer reviewers and uh, editors in journals prefer to have the version of record, the citation, and not the institutional repository citation, so the preprint citation. So our suggestion was to evaluate the possibility to cover the version of record. Here you got a huge opposition by commercial publishers because of the disruptive effects it would have on their business model, the substitution effect this would have compared to a limitation of the secondary publication right on uh, author accepted manuscript. Uh, there are several elements to be considered here if we go for a legislative measure. First of all, uh, the presence of uh, rights on uh, typesetting and layout by publishers, that is the case in some member states. And uh, there is a need to, in fact, uh, accrue more evidence on the real impact of introducing a version of record rule on the business model of publishers. This is what they asked, and this is something which, of course, we couldn't perform during uh, uh, the eight, nine months we had to uh, produce this report because this would have required an economic assessment, which we didn't have neither data nor time to perform. So here we flagged the need for more evidence in order to support the claim that the introduction of a version of record rule would have on as a substitution effect on the business model of publishers. 
There are also other non-legislative measures one may consider here, like a one-stop shop repository like Open Research Europe. Once again, this is not as effective as opening the secondary publication right to the version of record. Embargo period is another uh, very harsh point. Uh, we notice the difference among member states. Research performing organizations prefer no embargo or a very short embargo. Publishers indicate the need to reshape their business model if the embargo is lowered. We um, suggested to minimize embargo periods to what is strictly necessary to avoid substitution effect uh, or to bring it to zero completely because six months or one year for the speed of circulation of uh, and the speed of research currently means uh, eternity. And this applies particularly in social science where it already takes so long to publish and things are changing so, uh, so fast that not to have access to uh, materials uh, before a year, it's really too much. Here, uh, as to legislative measures, we emphasize the need for a careful balance and need to assess business models and impact on them more broadly. We were completely against non-legislative measures saying that it's not going to work. We also uh, underline the need to eliminate the limit to non-commercial uses because divergences in the interpretation of the meaning of what non-commercial is uh, may create more troubles than what you actually want to have, particularly when you have private and pub PPP, so private public partnerships. And it's not by chance that uh, uh, research performing organizations are the one more strongly advocating for an elimination of these requirements, exactly for the reasons I mentioned before on uh, the threshold for public funding. It creates far too many uncertainties, which frustrate the implementation and the oper operationalization of the right. Um, legislative measures are needed here because non-legislative measures are unlikely to uh, solve the problem. The very last policy options we advanced uh, was uh, to couple a secondary publication right with umbrella licensing and remuneration schemes, uh, which could be a way to tackle from an extended contractual perspective, uh, sort of, you know, mandatory licensing schemes, uh, ECL schemes, uh, to reach the same results, so not through a secondary publication right, but through extended licensing, uh, get into the same result. But we also notice that this can raise problems because it would still be, be nation, uh, so member state based, and it would very much be influenced by the different leverage and bargaining power that the different stakeholders have in different countries, which we know being completely uneven across member states. So it would be a suboptimal uh, result. It's also very difficult to, to, to reach the very same result of secondary publication rights because it's very unpredictable the way how these extended licensing schemes end up being shaped after the, the negotiation phase. So in terms of reaching quickly and effectively the open science uh, goals we have, Umbrella licensing and remuneration solutions and remuneration schemes uh, are far suboptimal and, uh, and not necessarily the best way out. Plus, they would require an intervention on copyright contract law, providing an ECL uh, with ex so a, a licensing with extended effects or a mandatory uh, negotiation in certain uh, sectors. And they would need to, and this would need to be harmonized across the EU if we want to reach any form of harmonization. And we would need a legislative intervention also if we want remuneration schemes uh, for publishers, for example, because it is not possible at a national level to turn uh, exclusive rights into remuneration rights. And on this, the Court of Justice was very clear. Now, very briefly, I show you some numbers, and then I open the floor uh, for Q and A's, if any. Um, you can see from the scholars who was in favor and who was not, who asked, answered very positively in light blue, rather positively in dark blue, gray, gray neither positively nor negatively, or rather negatively and very negatively in uh, uh, orange and yellow between non-commercial publishers, institutional publishers, commercial publishers, and RPOs. It, it's clear, and I also, Mm, 
gave you some hints about it uh, before that RPOs are clearly in favor and there is much more resistance from commercial publishers than from institutional or university-based publishers because of the impact they envision on their business model. And uh, in, in terms of potential uh, uh, positive effects uh, of uh, uh, SPR, you could see that uh, several uh, uh, respondents among RPOs believe that SPR would allow open access publications covering all uh, users, and this is what they should do. Uh, that several of them don't want to have uh, uh, an embargo or mostly a short embargo. 43% is in favor of covering the version of record. Uh, 38% plus 45 uh, uh, do not want any limitation to public funding or at least less than 50%. And most of them want to cover a broad range of scientific output. Publishers are... Uh, they they believe that all the policy options we advanced, or at least our favorite policy options uh, for the considerations I made before, would uh, result in a fundamental reshaping of their business model. And for this reason, they are generally uh, against. Uh, and uh, you could see still the difference between uh, high revenue and low revenue uh, commercial slash institutional publishers, they answer differently on the very same questions. So when you have uh, uh, publishers having uh, high revenue business models, they tend to uh, emphasize that it would cause a fundamental reshaping in their business model if you introduce a broad range of scientific output, if you eliminate or uh, decrease the threshold for public funding, cover the version of record and so forth. While if, they're, uh, if they, are, they have a low revenue business model, they are much less against. So you go under 50% of negative responses, which is indicative, I would say. Um, I would close now uh, with, uh, with the presentation because I think I already spoke too much. There are plenty of other uh, hints I, I could have illustrated uh, uh, during this presentation because, as I said, this is a Mammoothian thousand-page report uh, which would require a full day to be presented uh, completely. But I just wanted to give you some snapshots of uh, what's on the table and will probably be addressed by the next commission as priority. This is what DGRTD suggested at the closing of the previous commission. So I wouldn't like to sound too optimistic, but I think that SPR has some future ahead. And that's the reason why I wanted to focus on, uh, on SPR today to, to discuss it with you or, or to have uh, an open and meaningful conversation about it on top of what was in the content of the report. Thank you very much for your attention and the opportunity and happy to take all the questions and comments you may have. Thank you very much, Katarina. That was absolutely fantastic. And, and, and I think just obviously, thank you for the presentation. Thank you also for the work. I think that depth of exploration, that, that, that depth of actually looking at the, the, the copyright aspects around research, around the potential of legislation to actually improve things really is a game changer. And, and I, I suppose we can hope that, that the fact that there is now this stronger focus on research legislation in part is down to the fact that we can go into that with an evidence base, not just based on supposition or belief. So um, I want to remind everyone, please do, I can already see there's one question in the q and I can see one hand up. We're going to be taking questions through the Q&A function. So please do put your, your questions in there. You should be able to see it as a tab below. Um, but before opening the floor to others, I'd like to hand over to Ben White, who's the co-chair of the Knowledge Rights 21 Policy Committee, who is going to do an initial response. So Ben, over to you. Um, thank you, Stephen. And um, again, huge thanks to Katerina for uh, agreeing to talk to us about um, the report. I think she was extremely modest about the respondees. Um, I think the level of respondees was, is absolutely fabulous. So it creates a very, very strong, I think, evidence base for a very well executed, extremely detailed uh, report. 
Um, so uh, again, sort of congratulations on 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 the report. I'm still amazed that you're still standing. Um, I, I I guess I've got sort of two two questions. One on one on SPR, and I just wanted to draw a little bit of attention to another of of the recommendations from from the report. Um, it's 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 very interesting to see, you know what I mean what one of the I think themes of of the report is that we see um a lack of 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 common terminology and common understanding in the legislation but also through 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 the case law um which sort of builds up to the copyright key being in our words, a mess. I think Stephen's used this certainly in 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 some of the the roundtables that we've had with the commission that that you have the, the this mess around uh, copyright law, and I I think it's really really interesting looking at the <clears throat> provisions of the of SPRs uh, that we see some countries allowing downstream commercial use, whereas other countries do not allow through their um, Secondary Publishing Act commercial use, um, which of course is entirely at odds with the the, per, the reason for the funding in the first place. So funding organisations um, fund the research for academic reasons, but also for knowledge transfer. So we continue to see this, I think, lack of join up, policy join up, uh, between research science on the one side and, and and copyright on the other, as if they somehow <clears throat> live in 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 entirely different worlds. So um, I, I thought that was a very sort of interesting point. Staying with SPR, you 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 very quickly said that three step test wasn't relevant, um, and I just wanted to sort of ask the question that I think the the reason for that is because your proposal is about creating rights for authors and therefore it is not um a sort of a traditional exception and limitation because it's focusing on on the exclusive rights that authors have and expanding those is is, is that correct Katerina? Thank you, Ben, for the inputs and questions. It allows me articulating more on, on two very important points. The very first one you emphasize is fundamental. The problem we have in Europe, and this is striking compare, for example, to the US environment, is that we created uh, artificial silos between publicly funded and privately funded research. Uh, we don't reason in terms of ecosystem. And uh, we believe that we have the um, right to claim open access uh, only if taxpayers' money are put on the plate. While this is not about open science, science is science. And in order to ensure a greater uptake of results and also the possibility to build on existing knowledge, you can't really, uh, you can't afford uh, keeping these silos alive any longer uh, in terms of principle. And in terms of everyday practice, it just creates a confusion uh, that makes the operation of uh, the implementation of secondary publication right impossible. You know that uh, risk adverse organizations, uh, and those are generally public organizations who are aware of cost and they, are, they don't want to uh, risk being sued for mistakes in the interpretation of uh, legislative sources, they refrain from using secondary publication right if they are not 150% sure that uh, the publication falls into or meets the requirement. So, and we had plenty of researchers and research performing organizations uh, uh, during the survey in the free comment pay part specifying, and this was also in the workshop we had with the commission when we presented the results last February, they were they were bringing their own experience and they were saying, look, how many times it happens that uh, we th there is a member of the personnel who has a contract that is half funded by a company. Uh, and uh, this person produced a piece, how should I conceptualize? this result? Is it a result that was stemming from the work of a, a publicly funded person or the fact that this chair is funded for 60% by a company 
means that all what he or she produces cannot be subject to secondary publication right. And what happens if uh, a project uh, in the three different phases uh, is funded differently? So work package one has 100% private, work package two is 50-50, work package three, whatever. If the, uh, if the publication outcome afterwards is a, a product of all the three work packages, how should I calculate? The public-private interface. I mean, this look, sounds really like trivial points. If you if you if you if you listen to them, and say okay, but what are you talking about? But at the end, that's exactly the obstacle, because uncertainty means not application. Uncertainty equals to no news of the right, because you're talking about risk adverse entities. So, no. yeah, yeah, just go ahead. I, I, I suppose, I mean, one of the, the areas that we focus on is knowledge transfer and public-private partnerships, knowledge valorization. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I think it's important to say it is absolutely non-trivial, these issues. Um, you know, I've worked with startups who are very, cons you know, range from being very, very concerned um, that by inadvertently using scientific articles um, which are not 100% clear that they are under, a, for example, a CC BY license, that they bring liability to their to their company. Um, so, so I think if we sort of focus on the knowledge transfer aspect of this, it, it creates a huge logjam. Um, some small companies will make the decision will just take the risk others won't but as you say this isn't the case in the in america for example or indeed uh, large parts of east asia that do not make these artificial distinctions between commercial research and non-commercial research absolutely absolutely and uh that's exactly uh, what we try to point out that it's probably the most sensitive point to one on uh, the threshold on public funding first, uh, and then in terms of exploitation of the results, the non-commercial use. Uh, you, you can't really say to the private partner, you know, we, we're not going to, 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 to reuse potentially the results in a way that is uh, is okay with your business modeling, with your, with your target, but at the same time, uh, uh, this clashes with the notion of non-commercial use and would make secondary publication right impossible to implement. Also, the three-step test. Uh, there were plenty of objections stating that uh, the impact on publishers' business model uh, would not comply with the three-step test balancing. And we were keeping on pointing out that, look, this is a right. It's not an exception. And mm -hmm. by no means the international sources, TRIPS, uh, burn uh, WIPO copyright treaty, the three-step test refers to exceptions. And the legislator is free to introduce new rights and attribute new rights to others. It's not written anywhere that the EU legislator cannot. And mm -hmm. once you introduce another right, if these rights limit externally an existing right, dogmatically speaking, if you want to keep it plain, and if we want to, you know, be traditional lawyers, uh, abiding by uh, abiding by dogmas, uh, a right limits another right externally, while exceptions and limitations are internal limitations of an existing right. They are subject to the three-step test. Right against right, no. Mm. So, long story short. It's a part of the discretion of the legislator to decide on the basis of the evidence accrued that another right can be introduced and this is fair towards uh, owners, holders of pre-existing rights. Um, my, my second point was I just wanted to shine a light on one of the recommendations, which is a Europe-wide re research exception. Um, I it, one of one of the sort of so uh, perhaps reading more into into that recommendation than I should do. Um, 
Um, my my interpretation of that is, as we see in the Information Society Directive, the Copyright Directive, um, those exceptions that we see, see for research are very, very broad, very open. Let's use that term, open. Um, and Knowledge Rights 21, we, we, we believe that in Europe, not just the EU, but across Europe, that in order to support innovation, that we should introduce op an open and flexible norm which supports scientific research, commercial and, and non-commercial. And one of the, the pushback on, on that is that if we were to introduce an open norm that doesn't necessarily that doesn't have to be fair use, it could be something like we see in InfoSoc, it could be what we see in Japan, um, that that will calls um you know, that will re result in a lack of um how can i put it tight case law and therefore cause kind of confusion um uh, so i was it was quite interesting i th i thought your 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 analysis that actually if we look at core concepts of european copyright law we we see not only confusion within the, the a key we also see different case law so 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 i guess my question is if we were to introduce a a um an open flexible norm to support research how might we put in place sort of guardrails how, you know what might a system look like that to avoid unnecessary confusion that might that oh. might be, that's slightly beyond the report <laughs> Well, no, there was some policy uh, right. option on a general research exception, because that's also what we advanced as a necessary reform of the current copyright key to solve the um, disablers or to tackle the disablers to open science in the copyright key we uh, underlined in the mapping phase. Uh, the, the main problem you have, and uh, you already pointed it out, is the... Um, too vague terminology used at the EU level, which resulted in two similarly vague definitions at the national level and the resulting case law that was much stricter in their interpretation than what the provisions allowed. So paradoxically, the broader and the vaguer an exception is, the more rigid the interpretation is. I know that it might sound uh, oxymoric, but that's how it is. And that's because of uh, dependence of national courts vis-a-vis uh, -vis the strict interpretation of exceptions that was always part, always part of the member state common core in, in copyright. So how do you tackle this problem? One way is to be very clear about basic definitions, very much what, uh, what you saw in the data legislation. So clearer definition, uh, broad but clearer definition of what a research performing organization is, of what research activities are, of the what scientific output means, uh, what research uses are. And when you are clearer about beneficiaries, when you're clearer about users, when you're clearer about um, potential additional conditions of applicability, remuneration, and interplay with other existing rules, the better it is. So flexibility doesn't mean vague. Vague is not equal to flexible. Mm -hmm. We don't need to be afraid of specifications because specifications are there to give enough flexibility, but at the same time, give legal certainty that is better for operators. Mm. And we pointed out beneficiaries and users, mostly, as two areas where you don't have anything like this in the InfoSoc research exception, and that's the problem. So, so yes, I think I think I think that's a very good point. Um, Stephen's put in in the chat. Um, so we commissioned a uh, a report on open norms, looking at seven different jurisdictions, and Japan decided not to introduce fair use because of vagueness. And what it did was introduce a uh, an open norm 
um, for, for non-entertainment purposes. So essentially it defines the purposes of copyright to protect the exclusive rights of rights holders when there is some sort of an entertainment and enjoyment of, of, of the work. I guess enjoyment is a better term. And what they did was they listed a non in order because some of the concern coming from from uh, respondents to surveys was that fair use was uh, vague. What they decided to do was introduce uh, three different sorts of exceptions um, which fall under this non enjoyment purposes. And what they did was create a non exhaustive list. So. Um, again, sort of uh, went for a, a a less vague sort of um, uh, solution. But I've probably spoken enough and we're over time. Do we have, Stephen, any questions from the floor? Yes. So we have one question in the chat um, in, in the in the Q&A function. Um, this is asking us about the situation in Spain and Italy in particular, where I know that there's been debate and there have been some moves, but they they don't appear as as examples of fully matured secondary publication rights. I don't know if you'd be able to talk to the, to those experiences, Katerina. Um, Italy um, tried to do something like akin to secondary publication rights uh, during the first wave of SPR uh, revolution in member states. And it was tabled and uh, unfortunately was not really properly discussed uh, and was not uh, revived uh, uh, later on. And we, there were several scholars in Italy advocating for it. There were auditions uh, in order to, to try to push it forward, but uh, it, it didn't really, it didn't really go, go well. And it didn't go well mostly because of the attitude of the of the ministry in uh, in charge for copyright and this is what you have in several member states that's why we are arguing for an eu wide secondary publication right because we are aware of the fact that member states have different sensitiveness and different balance of powers uh, different uh, drivers in, uh, in 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 guiding uh, their legislator, and also a different approach to evidence based decision make it. Let's put it mildly. So uh, an EU wide secondary publication right would simply step over all this uh, um, inherently dif different approaches to legislation by cutting short. The problem. Thank you, and 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 indeed, I know that's that's one of the really key arguments, and we've certainly heard from um, researching you know, libraries in Belgium, for example, where they have a, a perfectly good secondary publication right, but then how that actually works, and what happens when a highly interconnected country like Belgium gets involved in research collaborations with other countries, and what rules actually apply. Maybe the researchers themselves don't think about it, but their administrators and their librarians definitely do have to and and too often just risk ending up saying no. So um, I think, uh, as Ben said, we've run slightly over time. Um, I know th this has been a, a fantastic presentation and I'm sure it's not the last time we'll be talking about this. I think, as you said, secondary publishing rights, it feels like it feels like it should be the first thing that that, that is reached for. It, it feels like it's an idea whose whose time has come at the European level. I know that certainly we would argue, and and I think you've given plenty of other examples, and there's many many more examples in the twelve hundred pages of other steps that can usefully be taken. That I think it would be a suboptimal outcome if we were to secure a secondary publishing right and nothing else. Um, certainly, what it does do is underline that really valuable point that. We can't just see research as something that you throw money at. It's not just a funding issue. It's not just a soft law issue. It's one where we do need to make sure that we're making sure that laws are promoting harmonization. They are looking to complement the work of researchers and that we, in doing so, we really need to put research first and not treat it just as a, a, a as collateral, not treat it just as a 
a secondary issue because that's how we end up in the incredibly messy situation that 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 we are in now. I think some of that data is definitely worth going back to. I think the huge level of support amongst researchers and research performing organizations. And so all of these very I don't know, loyally discussions about the difference between commercial and non-commercial, just if you ask the researchers for whom actually that line doesn't exist, um, then it, 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 it's clear that we need a much a much simpler way forwards, a way forwards that actually follows the interests of researchers rather than just of, of, of theoreticians, of lawyers. I think it's really interesting the data about how publishers are looking at things. I know that there are often howls of complaint about how people want to put publishers out of business, but I think your, your data is showing very clearly that smaller publishers, non-commercial publishers, institutional publishers are quite favourable to, to, to this sort of thing. And we talked a little bit about impacts the need to update business models but that is to assume that changing a business model is necessarily a bad thing and, and i don't think anyone is going to seriously argue that a business model is a value in itself what's important is the service that's provided and so even if a business model does need to change there's plenty of business models throughout history that have had to change because that's actually a good thing um I, I can think of a few but i won't mention them because that's probably not a great thing and, and I think finally that emphasis on on the potential, the value of working through contracts and, and, and the power of, of looking at, at contracts. And I know this is an issue that we we look at more broadly, that it's not necessarily so much the law, it's the way that contracts are framed and the powers and the protections provided in there that are actually a huge part of this. And especially in a digital world where what you can and can't do is more defined often by contract than by law. This is a huge, huge issue and potentially offers us a way of avoiding having to reopen pure copyright legislation, which just ends up being a very sort of Manichaean um, argument that just fills everyone's inboxes up with robocalls and spam and so on. And so it offers a, a much more interesting way forward that actually lets us focus on the issues rather than the theology of, of, of copyright. So... Um, I said we're over time. I did just want to, so obviously I want to say a big thank you to to Katarina. We really do encourage people to look at that at that big report. It is big, but it's big because there's a huge amount in it, and it's incredibly rich. So I definitely encourage people to take that look. Um, what I would say just to finish off on is to highlight just a couple of of quick things that we're doing on the the Knowledge Works Twenty One side. Um, on the screen right now, you have a link to our um, European um, action plan um, focused very much on research and that really highlights some of the arguments, the same sorts of arguments as Katerina has been making about the importance of putting in place a proper secondary publishing right and of complementary legislation elsewhere. And I think crucially pushing for that fifth freedom, putting research first when we are um, when we're legislating. And then simply end by saying a, a big Thank you, I said, to everyone who's here, to Katerina, to the rest of the team that worked on the DGRTD report. Um, the recording of this webinar will be made available on the Knowledge Rights 21 website. We are in the process right now of planning for um, a next webinar, and we have, should have a couple coming up still before the end of the year. So please do keep an eye out on our website. You will also have the option to sign up for updates and so on. But with that, simply to say thank you very much once again to Katerina, thank you very much to Ben for, for leading off on the questions and the discussion, and I wish everyone a very good rest of the day. Thank you.